Okay, good. So launching into the reproductive systems of the male and female of the human species. This is a bone that I found and actually found it in a store. <laughs> I bought it in Juneau, Alaska. Um, I don't know what it is. What do you think it is? What could that be? What do you think? You can write in the chat what you think it might be. It's a polished. Um, it has a bit of decoration. So this, this brown part here, that's a part of a baleen from a baleen whale. And this is bone at the end. So it was somewhat decorated. Yeah, any guesses? No guesses? <laughs> well, and then I'll tell you. It is a baculum. A baculum. What is a baculum, you say? A baculum is a penis bone. So this is actually from a walrus. And it's in the penis of the walrus. And it's not the only animal to have one. It's actually a, a feature of carnivores. All carnivores have them. Uh, uh, humans are the only primates that don't. Um, and of course, its function is to deliver sperm to the egg. So that is the function of the penis bone. For the walrus, the walrus has many females to inseminate in a fairly short period of time. So, and plus the male is busy protecting the females against other males. So it's... Uh, it's a way of delivering the sperm quite, quite quickly, really. Uh, and also there has been a little bit of, um, what shall I call a bit of an arms race. So, you know, I think we said before sperm is cheap. So humans make a lot of sperm. All animals and plants produce sperm. They're very small, very motile. Um, and can be produced in great quantities. Females, on the other hand, oh, hang on. Females, they have an egg or eggs, which are non-motile. So eggs are not motile. And we don't produce as many, females don't produce as many. So it's incumbent upon the female to protect that egg as well as she can, except from the most prime males, which will produce offspring, which can also be strong and attract mates. So uh, it's been more difficult for um, the eggs to be accessed by males over the evolution of many animals and many very interesting ways in which females will protect their egg, except for the males that they, they wish to mate with. That's very, very interesting phenomenon. Well, this lecture is um, about the male reproductive system. We will talk about reproductive structures and why there is even sexual reproduction. I mean, when you think about it, asexual reproduction or reproduction without a mate is way easier. And you can, you can have many more offspring because with asexual reproduction, say this is a, a female in asexual reproducing populations, it's always the females that produce the eggs. So they just make clones of themselves. Oh, there's two new female clones. And oh, after another generation, there's four. And that's terrific. So an asexual population can grow very fast. And you might wonder, well, why is it that, that sex even evolved? So for example, here is a female. And there is a 50% probability that a female will have a male or a female offspring. Well, the male uh, can't give birth. So only the female can produce offspring, male. So over the same generations, there are fewer um, offspring with sexual reproduction. But it did evolve and it's common 
And there is asexual reproduction in a lot of species, but sexual reproduction confers uh, variety. So there's more variation in a sexually producing population. The asexual population, they're all, they're all exactly the same. They're clones of the female. So any, any differences they have is due to mutation alone. Anyway, we'll talk about uh, sexual determination and development. The male reproductive anatomy we'll do today. Uh, we may or may not get around to uh, talking about puberty, but perhaps uh, on Thursday or tomorrow. And then spermatogenesis, uh, the spermatozoa and sperm, and the male sexual response. So what about sex? Well, reproduction is a property of a living thing. All living things reproduce and make copies of themselves. Uh, there's a great variety of methods of reproduction in, in nature, and it's so phenomenally diverse, it's so interesting. And what it means is that each offspring has two parents, and we receive genetic material from both. You and I receive 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 chromosomes from dad. And that provides genetic diversity because every single time the gametes are produced, they have a unique set of chromosomes almost. Well, at least one in 64 trillion times, it will be unique. So yeah, it's considered the foundation for survival and evolution because natural selection has a choice. So if, for example, the environment gets very hot, um, some animals cannot adapt, but those that have the gene for withstanding hot temperatures will survive. That's an adaptation. But if they're all clones and nobody has that gene, then the whole population will perish. So it's thought that that is the reason that sexual reproduction evolved in the first place. So there are two sexes as there are with all living organisms uh, for the most part. Um, and male and female gametes, gametes are the sex cell, so eggs and sperm. collectively are known as gametes. And they combine their genes to form a fertilized egg. It's an egg. And it doesn't show it in this picture, but the egg is considerably larger than the sperm. Indeed, 500 sperm or so will fit onto the end of a pin. But uh, eggs, um, forget exactly how large they are, but they are the largest cell of the human body. So with fertilization, we form a zygote for humans with 46 chromosomes. In 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. And if you recall from genetics, that means that they have the same genes, but different variations of the genes, which we call alleles. Yeah, well, that zygote just starts dividing and dividing and dividing, dividing, differentiating, dividing, differentiating, dividing, differentiating, dividing, differentiating, dividing, differentiating. <laughs> I could go on for days and days and days and days and days. Indeed, I could go on for uh, nine months. <laughs> if I were a human embryo. And then each cell will have those chromosomes. Except gametes. 
they'll always have half. Yeah. So looking at the reproductive system in general, Um, wait, let me go back. Let me go back. No, oh, okay, I don't have to go back. I thought I missed uh, something, but I did not, which means that I have to write it in notes. I should write this down because I've just been talking quite quickly. Okay, so uh, one gamete has motility. That is the sperm. The parent producing the sperm is male. And the male has the Y chromosome. The other gamete is an egg. Is, wait, is non motile, sorry, non motile. There's no flagellum. That's the egg. Also known as the ovum. Contains most of the nutrients. That's why it has to be large. And we'll see in development that when the egg first divides, the ball of cells doesn't get any larger than the original egg for some time. So the nutrients have to be enough for all of the cells that will, that will come from that egg, that the egg will be divided into. Uh, the parent of the egg is female. And in mammals, not in all animals, but in mammals, uh, the female also provides shelter. And nutrition, not all mammals, but most mammals by way of placenta, to the embryo. Good. So the reproductive system involves that primary sex organs, secondary sex organs, and secondary sex characteristics. So these are all in the interest of reproduction. So the primary sex organs produce the gametes. In males, that is the testes. And in females, the ovaries. The secondary sex organs that are essential for reproduction are a system of ducts. So the male is a system of ducts, glands, and the penis. And the function is to uh, deliver, store and deliver sperm. So function, storage, um, survival, and delivery of sperm.
The female is also a system of uh, tubes in part. The uterine tube, the uterus, and the vagina. Function to receive sperm. and nourish a developing embryo. Slash fetus when it starts to get a bit bigger. Yeah, so that is the function. So oh, I was gonna tell you about, um, about fallopian tubes. It, so they're not called fallopian tubes anymore. Now they're called uterine ducts because we're losing uh, the what's it called again etymology you know when structures are named after people so gabriel fallopio he named the uterine ducts when he discovered them through dissection um quite a long time ago and oh my gosh i'm terrible with dates <laughs> 15 something <laughs> anyway um he called them um fallopian tuba because he felt that because they were curled and because the end was wide that it looked like the instrument the tuba and then when he published that work uh, the the feminine version in italian of tuba is tube so t-u-b-e and everyone just thought he meant tube so it became the fallopian tube yeah he's quite was well, quite a remarkable person, actually. He distinguished between uh, syphilitic and non-syphilitic warts on the penis. And he pointed out um, also the danger of mercury therapy. So when, when people had syphilis, it was thought that mercury would cure it. And of course, they gave it to cows, which gave their milk to uh, infants, um, not cows, sorry, goats. But anyway, he is the father of the condom, apparently. The first condom was a small linen cap drenched in a salty and herbal solution. And he figured it worked because he tested soldiers who had gone off and come back from war and didn't contract syphilis. So it was a century later, the condom was then developed from sheep intestines. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that's the development of the condom. All right, so sorry about that. Okay, so secondary sex characteristics. Uh, these are features that develop at puberty. They do not develop before puberty. Uh, they are there to attract members of the opposite sex. So they are such things as pubic hair, axillary hair that's armpit, axillary, and facial hair. Scent glands. The modified sweat glands called apocrine glands. Um, and body, body morphology changes as well. So um, in males, there's more musculature. And so it lowers the male voice. But that doesn't have anything to do with dropping of the testes. Uh, the testes uh, dropped a long time ago. So uh, that's a myth. Rather, the musculature pushes the larynx forward in the male. So the vo his voice gets deeper. <laughs> So what is the role of the chromosomes to determine sex? Yeah, so if the sperm carries an X, 
the female gets the X. But sperm also carry a Y. If the Y is passed down, the offspring will be male. A female only has XX. So a female will always pass down the X chromosome. So we have 22 pairs of autosomes. Those are all the chromosomes that are not sex chromosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. So what is the probability of an offspring being male or female? It's 50%. So there's 50% probability because uh, the sperm could carry either the X or the Y. So then how then do these chromosomes determine the sex of an embryo? As an embryo is a default female until about eight weeks. So what is it? Let's take a look at the structures, the reproductive structures in an embryo that's only five to six weeks. Five to six weeks. Sexually indifferent age. I'm going to say undifferentiated. As far as uh, sex structures go. So what this embryo has uh, are two ducts of interest here. The mesonephric duct and the paramesonephric duct. And these are ducts that will survive. The mesonephric duct will survive if the embryo becomes male. The paramesonephric duct will survive if the embryo becomes female. So what does it require to become male or female? Hormones. Surprise, surprise. Hormones and sex differentiation. So it requires an interaction between uh, genetics and hormones. So at uh, six weeks. You know, embryos do develop at slightly different rates, so approximately six weeks. Uh, there's two sets of ducts exist. Two sets, two sets. The mesonephric develop into the male system of ducts. And the paramesonephric ducts develop into the female. Uh, ducts, reproductive tract. They also, before when we used uh, people's names, or were called malarian uh, ducts. reproductive system. So in both cases, the other ducts 
uh, degenerate. The other ducts will degenerate. Why? So if there is no Y chromosome with in particular a gene of interest, it's called the SRY gene. I mean, it could be that the Y chromosome doesn't have the SRY gene uh, through mutation, but it's, it stands for the sex determining region of the Y chromosome. So it's something that you don't want to say over and over again. It's too long. Sex determining region of the Y chromosome. So that's the SRY gene. Then the embryo develops into a female. If, on the other hand, SRY is present, then as all genes do, it codes for a protein. That triggers the development of testes. which produce um, testosterone. The hormone that determines uh, maleness. Um, and one very important one called the malarian, another hormone called the malarian inhibiting factor, and that causes the malarian duct to disintegrate. It degenerates the malarian duct or the paramesonephric duct. So female development is in the absence of these hormones. <clears throat> so it's testosterone that makes the difference. Um, and one thing that's very interesting is the determination of male and female. So um, the presence of the SRY gene, you would think would be an indication that an individual is male, but an individual can be um, XX with an insertion of the SRY gene. An individual can be XY with a deletion of the SRY gene. Uh, so there are some um, anomalies, exceptions, I should say, exceptions. Okay, so embryonic development. While I'm showing you these slides, by the way, I know there's a lot of um, words on here. I should just cross them all out, but they are a way to orient you to the structure that I'm showing. But really the structures of interest here are the ones that are surrounded by by red, so I'll just point those out. So here's the, in the male, about, about seven to eight week of the male embryo, you can see that the paramesonephric duct here is degenerating. Uh, for the female, eight to nine weeks or so, it takes that long. For the mesonephric duct, 
to disintegrate, which is here. Uh, do we have remnants of these? Yes, actually we do. We do have remnants. And what's interesting about that, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of hermaphroditic animals. There are hermaphroditic animals that have both male and female genitalia. And so there are um, males that have female genitalia that function. In humans, there are hermaphroditic humans, but they're non-functioning as both sexes. But with some hermaphroditic animals, like snails, for example, slugs, um, some fishes that are sequentially hermaphroditic, they exhibit functioning male and reproductive systems. Very interesting. So there are some fish, for example, they're uh, wrasses. So there are these small fish that are cleaner fish of other fishes gills and, and mouths. And these researchers had these fish in a tank and they were watching them. And it turned out that only the male would do the cleaning part, but there would be a number of females present as well. And they thought, well, what would happen if we removed the male? Would one of the female fishes take over the job of cleaning the, um, the gills of the other fish? And and then so they went away, they took, the, they took the male out, they went away, they came back and whoa, there was another male there. And they were like, who put that there? <laughs> but it turned out that the females turned into males. So they're sequentially hermaphroditic. The female uh, gonads and genitalia are there, but they remain undeveloped until there's a requirement for another male. And that's not that uncommon in nature. Yeah, you know, so that's what I want to point out there. So embryonic development uh, at birth, the male, your inner bladder, of course, both have the, that, uh, in different locations though. So in the female, I just like to point this out, the urinary bladder is moved to the side. But of course, with, with pregnancy, and actually the uterus does put a little bit of pressure on the bladder. So if you're wondering why females generally uh, have to pee more often, it's uh, usually the case or often the case. It's just because the uterus is on top of the bladder. So uh, yeah, so at birth, the male has all the male reproductive structures seminal vesicle, prostate gland, the bulbo-urethral gland, which was used to be called cowpers, uh, the ductus deferens, which used to be called vas deferens, uh, the epididymis storage, ductules, I'll show you those when we look at the testis, uh, the testes, the urethra, and the penis. Yeah, so we'll be looking at the male reproductive system. So this is a bit out of order, but um, I just wanted to show you one anomaly of sex determination. So the, an androgen insensitive person with androgen insensitivity syndrome is genetically male, interestingly. But this is a, this is a different phenomenon from what we were talking before in that testosterone is secreted um, you know, at that eight or nine weeks. But the target cells don't have the receptors for the hormone, for testosterone. So there's no masculinizing effects. So the external genitalia and the sex characteristics are feminine, but there, is no, there are no ovaries or uh, uterus or vagina. I'll just write that down. External genitalia and secondary sexual characteristics. But and no ovaries, uterus, or vagina.
All right, back to development of external genitalia. So at six weeks, there are some developing structures. So in development, cells differentiate and they become a different than the other cells around them. In this case, we have the genital tubercle, a urogenital folds, and the labioscrotal fold. So that's at six weeks. At eight weeks, uh, the fetuses have the same three structures, but at end of about week nine, sexual differentiation is starting. So here at eight weeks, we've got a combination of the glands and a small a bit of tissue together called the phallus. The urogenital fold here. And the labioscrotal fold. And this is the beginnings of the anus. So by 10 weeks from um, the phallus, there is a developing gland, glands, this is the glands here. And these are the urogenital folds. This is the labioscrotal fold. And you can see that there is already a difference at 10 weeks between the male and the female. So the structures take on slightly different shapes and the cells migrate somewhat differently and start to differentiate. So you can see the difference here in the labioscrotal fold. So the labioscrotal folds in the female become the labia majora and the urogenital folds become the labia minora. In the male, the labioscrotal fold becomes the scrotum. So the tissue migrates and folds. And when it folds, it joins and creates uh, a section called the perineal raphe, which is distinguishable on the shaft of the penis. Um, at 12 weeks, the tissue has differentiated considerably and um, the glands has become the glands of the clitoris in this case, the glands has become the glands of the penis. They develop from the same tissue, so we call them homologous. So, uh, the, mm, I'll just write on here. So male and female organs that develop from the same embryonic tissue are homologous. Um, so what is homologous? Um, the scrotum and the labia majora
and the glands. of the penis and the clitoris or clitoris. Yeah. So in some cases, the, the clitoris can be quite enlarged and um, a baby may be misidentified mis as male. Um, in other cases, the ovaries can descend into the labia majora as if they were testes descending into a scrotum. So there can be misidentification at birth. So let's see about the testes. Uh, they, they don't start uh, lower in the body, rather they begin development near the kidney when the fetus is developing. And there is a structure, a cord. So a cord like muscular structure um, called the gubernaculum. extends from the gonad. The gonad is another name for either testes or ovaries. They're also collectively known as gonads. <clears throat> to the abdominopelvic floor. And it shortens as the fetus grows. So it's attached to the gonad and it just starts shortening and shortening. And as it shortens, it draws the uh, testes down. Um, it passes through a hole in the abdominal wall through the inguinal canal. And it's accompanied by a nerve an artery and vein. It drops below the body because the sperm must be produced at a lower temperature than the body. And we'll look at how the, the testes are kept at a lower temperature. So about um, 3% or so of boys are born with undescended, a, a single undescended testis, usually single undescended testis. So that would require surgery within um, 18 months. I think they do it usually between six and 12 months. 3% of boys born with undescended testis which requires surgery. And uh, definitely within 18 months or sooner. So here's a diagram. And the cord, the gubernaculum here goes through the abdominal wall and is led into the scrotal swelling. Yeah, so that's at seven months. And so here it's lowered quite considerably. And in one month it should have descended.
All right, so that is enough about development of structures. Let's look at the boundaries of the external genitalia of the male. The boundaries uh, of what's known as the perineum, the perineum, which is the area of genitalia. Uh, so it's divided into the triangle called the anal triangle, which includes the anus, and the urogenital triangle, which includes uh, the penis and the testes. Yeah, the ischial tuber tuberosity, those are, those are the bones that you can feel when you're sitting, when you're sitting down. The male perineum. The male reproductive system, which we said was a system of ducts, includes uh, the penis, the ductus deferens, the glands of the penis, the prepice, which is the skin covering the penis, the epididymis, the testis, the scrotum, and accessory glands or ducts, the ejaculatory duct, seminal vesicle, prostate gland, bulbourethral gland, and other structures that are around, <laughs> but not part of the system are the bladder, the pubic symphysis, the urethra. Now the urethra is part of the system. It's just that the urethra in a male, uh, only, in the ma only in the male, delivers both a urine and sperm, although not at the same time because of the sphincter of the bladder. Yeah. So let's look at the testis and the associated structure. So this is, this is a primary sexual organ. So the organs that produce eggs and sperm or gametes are known as primary sexual organs. Um, so it is supplied by blood through the spermatic cord, which contains blood vessels and nerves and is a muscle as well. It has oblique muscle around it. The You know what, I think I'm going to write before I look at this. Let's, let's write about the testis and then we'll look at the diagram and then we'll take our first break. If that's all right. It's an oval, about four centimeters long. Two and a half centimeters diameter. It's a fairly small structure and you might be uh, surprised to learn that, although we've said this before, that there are approximately uh, 300,000 sperm produced per minute in the male testes. Considering it's such a small organ produces a lot of spermatozoa. <laughs> So uh, one thing I wanted to mention was the capsules or the tunics that are surrounding the testes. So it's covered by a sac-like extension of the abdominal peritoneum. That's the wall, the membranous wall of the abdomen. And when the testes are descending, they descend through the abdomen and so that uh, peritoneum comes with it. And that's called the tunica vaginalis.
there's a white fibrous capsule that surrounds the testis called the tunica albuginea. And it's interesting, it, it infolds and it divides the testis into compartments. So it's a white fibrous capsule and it infolds um, to form septa. Septa are structures that divide two things. They divide uh, the organ into compartments. And the compartments contain the structures that go through spermatogenesis that make sperm. So those are seminiferous tubules. And that is the structure where sperm is produced. And each tubule has a thick uh, germinal layer. Germ cells are the diploid cells that will go through spermatogenesis to make sperm. Germinal epithelium. Composed of germ cells in the process of spermatogenesis, the making of sperm. Yeah, and there's, there's a few other cells in there, uh, sustentacular cells. They also line the tubules. And they promote uh, sperm development, and importantly, they form a blood testis barrier. Why does the sperm require a blood testis barrier? It's because the male immune system doesn't recognize the sperm as being a self, so the immune system will attack sperm. And it's formed by tight junctions between the sustentacular cells. So essentially they form a kind of a barrier against uh, blood. thereby separating sperm from the immune system. Okay, now let's look at the testis. It'll make more sense now. Yeah. So here is the tunica albuginea. It's this outer fibrous layer. It infolds, as you can see here, forming septa that divide uh, the, the interior of the testis into uh, lobules. 
And the tunica vaginalis is on the outside. Um, and all in here, these are all seminiferous tubules. So there is an enormous amount of seminiferous tubules. Uh, if you stretch them out, how long would they be? I forget, but very long, <laughs> very long. They're all busily making a sperm. And they drain into this structure known as the reet testis. So that's here. And this is kind of a network. So that's where the seminiferous tubules drain into the reet, reet testis. And then from there, they go into the efferent ductule. And from there, they go into the epididymis. And that's where they're stored for about 60 days. Yeah. And if there is ejaculation, then they will travel into the ductus deferens. Uh, yeah. So there is relatively low blood pressure, blood pressure of the testicular artery. So the sperm develop very large mitochondria, which helps them to survive. It's a fairly hypoxic environment. And veins a drain into the inferior vena cava. Here's a cross section, an actual micrograph of a seminiferous tubule. So it's a highly magnified. This is 50 micrometers here. And the lining is uh, the, the germ cells here. They line the outside. And as the sperm uh, are being um, made, as the germ cells are differentiating and going through spermatogenesis, they move inward to the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. And that's where they travel into the reet testis from there. So the germ cells are undifferentiated. And the sper spermatids are the very initial formed sperm, but they're not fully developed there yet. So I think I'm going to end there for now.